has a word that I'd like to share with you. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 11. And I just want to read a portion of a paragraph into your hearing, verses 1 through 6. Matthew chapter 11, <clears throat> verses 1 through 6. If you will stand with me as I read the word of God into your hearing. Now let me uh, give this disclaimer. There's nothing really necessarily spiritual about standing uh, when the word of God is read. If nothing more else, it gets the blood running warmer uh, in your veins. So that whatever happens today, when I go back home, I'm going to tell them I stood them up. I stood them up. <laughs> Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. Reading from the New King James Bible. If you found it, can you say amen? Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Yeah. Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Verse 3, and he said to him, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? I want to talk about the scandal of unexpected outcomes. You may be seated. The scandal of unexpected outcomes. I read a quote not long ago that says, what screws us up the most in life is the picture in our heads of how it's supposed to be. Sometimes in life there is a disconnection between the life that one expected to have and the life that one actually has. This can happen, if you will, in a positive way when the outcome of one's life exceeds what he or she expected, causing him to be surprised, awestruck, and even humbled. A person in that kind of situation probably thinks to himself that with all of the obstacles that I've had to overcome in life and with all of the odds that were stacked against me, who would never in my wildest dreams could I have imagined that my life would have gone this far? Who would ever have thought that life would have turned out so great for me? On the other hand, this disconnection between the life that one expected to have and the life that one actually has can happen to some in a negative way. He or she had lofty dreams and ambitions and goals in life, but life didn't turn out the way that they had expected. Perhaps it describes someone who has matriculated some four years at some higher institution of learning only to look back over their lives and wish now that they had majored in something else because they live with a sense of regret. Or perhaps it describes someone who has chosen a career path and have worked on that job for decades and now realize that it's left them feeling less than fulfilled and they wish they had done something else. Or perhaps it describes someone's marriage that is not necessarily a, an, 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 a relationship that brings happiness and peace, but rather one of, of pain and, and agony. Oh, it didn't start out that way. When you first got married to your significant other, you thought that they or he or she was the love of your life. And now if you're honest about it, sometimes you wonder why you ever did it. If you can't say amen, just look amen. Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way that we expect life to turn out. Someone has suggested that, um, that, that, that expectation is the root of all heartache. Somehow we've convinced ourselves that if life had only turned out the way that we expected life to turn out, that we would be so much happier. But that's not necessarily a true proposition. Because I know people who seem to have everything that one would need to have the American dream and yet they are still unhappy and unfulfilled. Sometimes, child of God, life will not turn out the way we expected that it would turn out. And when this happens, we can either allow it to cause us to become cynical and despondent and live with a perpetual sense of regret and bitterness, or it can become a teachable moment. Yeah. 
It helps us to better understand the purposes and plans of God for our lives. This is the lesson that John the Baptist learned in this little text that I've read into your hearing today. Now, I don't want to be assum uh, take the assumption that all of us know or are familiar with John's story. So let me take a moment to give you a cliff note abridgment of his personal history. His father, Zacharias, was a priest. His mother, Elizabeth, was a relative of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Even before John was born, John had special written over his life. Because before he was born, an angel came and gave his father a prenatal prognosis of the trajectory of his prophetic ministry. The angel told Zacharias that you and your wife are going to have a, a son. You're going to name him John. He's going to be great in the sight of God. And many are going to rejoice at his birth because he's going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And the angel even told Zacharias that John was going to become a mighty preacher of the word of God. And he was going to cause many of the children of Israel to turn back to God because he was going to preach in the power and spirit of the prophet Elijah. And he would prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah. Even before John was born, he had special written over his life. Surely, no doubt, John's family had, had expected that John would follow in the footsteps of his father, Zacharias, and become a priest like his father. But John, rather, when he became of age, chose to become a prophet instead. Maybe his family had fully expected that John would go to rabbinical school like his father. But when John became of age, he chose to go into the desert and live the aesthetic life. Or maybe they ex had expected that John would wear the priestly attire of a priest like his father. But John rather chose to wear the simple clothes of a prophet, a camel's hair tunic and a leather belt. No doubt they had expected that John would be erudite and refined and eat the finest of kosher food like his father. But John chose rather to eat the simple food of the desert, uh, locusts and wild honey. Uh, John had special written over his life even before his ministry got started. John didn't start preaching in a fancy synagogue. He didn't start preaching in a, a, a pulpit in, 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 the, in the temple. No, John started preaching out in the desert. He preached fiery and powerful sermons. He told the people that they needed to repent of their sins. He reminded the people that the kingdom of God was imminent, that it was at hand, and that the people needed to repent of their sins. And as a sign of their repentance, they needed to be baptized. People were streaming out of the cities, going out into the desert to be baptized by John. As a matter of fact, he baptized so many of them until they gave him a nickname. They called him the baptizer. John was preaching the gospel all over the desert. And the more he preached, the larger the crowds grew. John was the hottest ticket in town. Unlike the Pharisees and other religious leaders, John did not sugarcoat his message. No, John wasn't afraid to tell it like it is. He wasn't afraid to speak truth to power. But it was precisely his unabashed boldness that got him in trouble with King Herod. But John had had the unmitigated gall to tell King Herod that he was wrong for marrying his dead brother Philip's wife. And as a result, Herod had John thrown into one of his prisons. It was from that moment on that John's ministry began to slowly spiral downhill. No longer would uh, the large crowds gather to hear him preach his fiery and passionate sermons. No, all he can do now is languish there in a dungeon cell. I'm sure that John must have felt, uh, child of God, irrelevant. He must have felt that for all practical purposes, he had been taken out of the game. For John, child of God, who was once the talk of the town, all he could do now was sit there and languish in a dirty, dark 
dank dungeon cell. A oh, child of God, I'm sure he must have said to himself, this is not how I expected my ministry to end. John had fully expected that he and Jesus would have gone on a tag team mission together as he helped Jesus to, uh, to in inaugurate this new kingdom that he came to start. But rather, John is now sitting in a jail cell. At first it was for weeks, and then it was for months, and the months turned into almost two years. John, who had once been the talk of the town, is sitting there in jail because he told Herod the truth. Well, while prison must have been a, a, a supreme, a, a, an ordeal for John, there was a silver lining, and that was the fact that John was permitted to receive visitors. And from time to time, some of his uh, disciples would come and pay him a visit. And John was curious to know what was happening on the outside, and particularly what was happening in the, the ministry of his cousin Jesus. For remember that before John went to jail, John had the privilege of baptizing Jesus out in the wilderness and at the baptism when Jesus showed up John declared in front of all those people behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world so John wanted to know what was happening in the ministry of his cousin and the disciples of John said well John you remember how large those crowds used to be when you preached in the wilderness they said well the crowds are much larger that's coming to hear Jesus. And John, we need to tell you that Jesus is preaching a slightly different kind of message that you were preaching. Unlike your bold, in your face, uh, uh, a pronouncement of the judgment and impending doom of God, Jesus is preaching a message of, of, of mercy and forgiveness. And John, we need to tell you that Jesus is showing compassion on the people. He's performing miracles. He's causing the blind to see and the lame are being able to walk and the deaf can hear and the lepers are being cleansed and the poor have the gospel preached to them. I'm sure John must have been taken aback by this news when he said to them, what do you mean he's not preaching about the impending judgment of God? And what do you mean he's preaching a message of forgiveness and mercy? And what do you mean that he's performing miracles while for months on end I've been languishing here in this prison cell? Why don't he perform a miracle and get me out of jail? I'll tell you what I need you to do. I need you to go ask him a question for me. You go ask him are you the one that we've been looking for or should we look for somebody else John ran up against the scandal of unexpected outcomes that the life that he expected to have did not square up with the life that he actually has and every now and then if you live long enough in this life every one of us are going to have to face that scandal that life sometimes doesn't turn out the way that you expect life to turn out and when that happens, I'm glad you asked. The text tells us, teaches us some valuable lessons. That when the life that you expected to have does not square up with the life that you actually have in the first place, it reminds us that it is only human to express your doubts. Some of us might have been taken aback by the fact that John, who uh, had so passionately declared of Jesus in the wilderness at his baptism, behold, the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Some of us are taken aback by the fact that now John is asking, are you the one that we've been looking for? Or should we look for someone else? This is the same John who declared to Jesus, I'm not worthy to untie your sandals. This is the same John who said, I baptize with water, but he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. And now John is saying, are you the one? Or should we look for someone else? Brothers and sisters, uh, may I remind us today that authentic faith is not the absence of doubt. Authentic faith says that there will come moments in your life you will get to those precipices in life where your faith is about to fall over the cliff. You have your moment of doubt where you wonder, does God know? Does God care? Does God exist? Authentic faith is not the absence of doubt, but authentic faith will ultimately trump your doubts and cause you to say, but I still believe. 
regardless of how my life and my circumstances may be looking at any given moment in my life. I submit to you that John doubted because of his circumstances. For you see, he had just heard his disciples talking about, bragging about Jesus' miracle working abilities. And he wondered why Jesus hadn't performed a miracle to free him from jail. He wondered why uh, he who had come to set the captives free had not set him free. And so in his circumstances being less than ideal, he says, you ask him, are you the one? Or should we look for someone else? May I remind somebody today that when you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life. I'll say that again. When you, when you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life. Am I talking to someone today? You look back through the rearview mirror of your life and you wonder, why is my life not further along that I had fully expected to be at a certain level in my life by right now? But that is not my reality. You wondered, you, you expected it not to have to be struggling financially at this point in your life. You, 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 you were planning to be on easy street at this point in your life, but that's not your reality. Or maybe someone today says, I, I fully expected to be married by now, but now you're 30, 40, 50, 60. And that's not your reality. Sometimes life doesn't turn out the way you expect it. Am I talking to some pastor? That you have gone to the right schools, you've dotted your I's and crossed your T's, and yet you've been pastoring that same 175 people for the last 20 years. Some of your, or, 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 some of your colleagues who you graduated with are pastoring mega churches, and you wonder, does God know, care about me? Why, why won't God bless my ministry. Am I talking to somebody today where, that when you place your expectations in your circumstances, you set yourself up to be disappointed in life because every now and then we are all going to have to deal with this scandal where in the, the, uh, the life that we expected to have will not always square up with the life that we actually have. And when that happens, it is only human to express your doubt. I submit to you that John doubted because of his circumstances. But I think that John also doubted because of the Lord's methodology of doing things was different than he expected. For you see, uh, John was a rebel and uh, he expected, uh, he, he, was, he wanted a revolution. He, like the other Jewish religious leaders, they looked for a Messiah to come as more of a military leader, a militant Messiah. Messiah, a geopolitical figure who would raise up an army and go to war with Rome and set the Jewish nation free from Roman domination. And yet on every occasion when they tried to crown Jesus as a king, he always rejected those overtures because he says, I didn't come to be some earthly despot. I didn't come to be some earthly king. I came to establish a higher kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so because Jesus didn't show up as the kind of militant Messiah that the leadership expected, John is saying, are you the one or should we look for another? Sometimes we face those moments of doubt in our lives because God doesn't, doesn't move the way we think God ought to move. You were so sincere when you prayed to, for God to open that door of opportunity. You were so sincere. You trusted God that God was going to open that door, but somehow the door didn't open. Am I talking to some pastor today? You have applied for church after church, and every time you got down, they, they got down to the last three. You were always in the last three, and you thought you were going to get called to that church, and yet they called somebody else. Sometimes you find yourself wondering, what's wrong with me? Why won't God bless my ministry? Why won't God open the door for me? Why won't God open that, that opportunity for me? But child of God, may I remind us today that God is sovereign. That means he can do what he wants, when he wants, to whom he wants, through whom he wants, whenever he gets ready, and he doesn't owe anybody an explanation. And you can get mad at God, shake your fist at God, stomp, holler, and spit at God, but guess what? When your makeup runs dry up, he's still going to be God. And the reason he's still going to be God, because he's always been God. He didn't run for the office. Nobody voted him in, and can't anyone vote him out? Moses said, from everlasting to everlasting, 
saying, thou art God. He's God, and he doesn't need your permission to be God. But can I tell you something? No is an answer. God is not obligated to tell you yes just because you're sincere and just because you love him. God, who is infinitely wise, sometimes in his own, by his own wisdom says no. You don't believe me? Ask Paul. He had some ailment that he describes as being like someone sticking, driving a stake in his side. And Paul prayed not once, not twice, but three times for the Lord to remove the thorn. And yet God said to the apostle Paul, who wrote most of our New Testament, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. In other words, God told Paul, no not going to change your circumstance but I am going to give you the grace to deal with it can the church say deal with it deal with it I think John doubted because of his circumstances I think John doubted because of the Lord's methodology of doing things was different, different than he expected but I think John doubted because he had a problem with the Lord's timing you see, John had wondered why there were no imminent signs of this judgment that he had been preaching out in the wilderness. He wanted those sinners to be judged right now. But for Jesus, the judgment would ultimately come, but it would come at the end of the age. And so John was wondering, why won't these sinners, aren't these sinners judged right now? And Jesus said, they're going to be judged, but not now. Oh, uh, you see, brothers and sisters, what do you do when your right now runs up against God's not now? You've got a right now problem and you want God to move right now. But God, who is God enough to take his own time, sometimes says not now. Because the reality is you can't hurry God. Because God doesn't have emergencies. We have emergencies. God doesn't have deadlines. There are no lines that if he doesn't cross by a certain time he's going to be too late if you don't believe me ask those two sisters who said Lord if you had been here our brother would not have died and Jesus said listen daughter you're going to see your brother again she said I, I know I'll see him again in the general resurrection of the dead he said it's obvious baby that you don't know who you're talking to because I am the resurrection and the life I am the answer to your prayer right now Sometimes we doubt because God don't move when we want God to move. But God moves on his own schedule. Do I have a witness today? Sometimes we run up against that scandal, the scandal of unexpected outcomes. That sometimes the life that you expected to have will not necessarily square up with the life that you actually have. And when that happens, it is only human to express your doubts. But secondly, may I remind you today, if I lean into this passage another way, I would suggest to you that when the life that you expected to have does not square up with the life that you actually have, this text reminds us that your faith in Christ is not in vain. I said your faith in Christ is not in vain. Jesus was not taken aback by the fact that John, his friend, had his moment of doubt. But rather, neither does Jesus rebuke John for expressing his doubt, but rather he tenderly and lovingly provided a word of encouragement for his friend. He knew that John knew the scriptures and would understand his reply. And so he says to John's curious, he says, you come here. I want you to go back and tell your teacher, go tell your teacher what you heard today. Go tell your teacher the, how you heard the power and the anointing of, the, of, of, of God being on the preaching of, of the kingdom of God. But don't just tell your teacher what you heard with your ears. I want you to tell him what you saw with your eyes. Tell him how you saw the blind are able to see. Tell him how the deaf receive their hearing. Tell him how the lame are now able to walk. Tell him how lepers have been cleansed. And tell him how the poor have had the gospel preached to them. And then John, who knows the scriptures, will know that what the prophet Isaiah prophesied of me in Isaiah 61 and 1 is being fulfilled 
right now this day. In other words, Jesus was trying to remind John that his faith was not in vain. Every now and then we find ourselves discouraged on the journey. We find ourselves discouraged because life and didn't turn out and circumstances don't always turn out the way that we want circumstances to turn out. And in those moments of, our, of doubt and, and, and despondency, we find ourselves wondering, does faith in God matter? Are we on some kind of a wild goose chase? Is this uh, some futile uh, activity that we're engaged in? Does faith in God matter? I mean, you claim the promises of God and yet your present reality looks nothing like the promises you claim. You are giving your tithe every time you get paid, every pay period you give your tithe and yet you are struggling each month. There's always too much month left at the end of your check. And you find yourself saying, well, where are those windows? Where are those blessings that I'm supposed to receive that I won't have room enough? You're trying to live a godly life. Now, none of us are perfect, but at least you're trying to live right. And yet, you're struggling from day to day. And there's a joker down the street who doesn't go to anybody's church. He doesn't have a care in the world. Sometimes at those moments, we find ourselves wondering, does faith in God really matter? But at those moments, just at those moments of our despair, God comes along and gives us a reassurance that our faith in him is not in vain. Sometimes he reassures us with a sense of his abiding presence. Sometimes he'll reassure you through a sermon that you hear. Maybe the sermon you hear right now or a song that the choir sings, or sometimes he'll send a friend or a perfect stranger who comes at just the right time and says just the right thing to remind you that your faith in Christ is not in vain. That is why we gather every seven days in houses of worship all over this country and around the world. We gather together to not only reaffirm our mutual faith and corporate worship of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we gather together as a cornonia, as an ecla, as a called out assembly of God because at church we know that we can get a word, a word that will help us to look at life and all all of the vicissitudes and problems we face uh, square in the face and our faith says that, that, that our faith in Christ will help us life to, 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 to overcome anything that you throw against us. That's what got our slave forefathers and mothers through the debauchery of slavery. They were treated, those slaves, not as persons, but as property, as nothing more than common cattle and chattel, if you will. They had no military power. They had no political power. All they had was an abiding hope and faith in God to believe that regardless of how bad things were, that a better day was coming. Even in their hymn, hymn you hear them singing songs that reminded them that a better day is coming. They'd say, I, I'm so glad that trouble won't last always. They were saying, a better day is coming. You would hear them, if you will, some of those slaves never owned a pair of shoes. They went barefoot all their lives, but they would sing uh, by, by faith, I've got shoes and you've got shoes and all of God's children got shoes and one of these days I'm going to put on my shoes and walk all over God's heaven. A better day is coming. They would say, swing low, sweet chariot. Because they believe that a better, a better day is coming. Are y'all with me today? And here's some sophisticated Negro today who has moved on up to the east side and finally gotten his piece of the pie. And now Sunday morning is not a time to go to church. Oh, shame on you because everything that we have acquired as a people, we got it through the direct or indirect influence of the church. It was the church that pricked the conscience of a racist society and pulled down the walls of segregation. And now you are able to drive those cars and live in those neighborhoods and make that money. But now that you've made it, you act like you don't need the church anymore. Shame on you. I just want to tell you that sometimes in life, 
you're going to run up against a scandal of unexpected outcomes. That the life that you expected to have will not always square up with the life that you actually have. And when that happens, it is only human to express your doubt. When that happens, you need to be reminded that your faith in Christ is not in vain. But if I would, if I would, would if you would indulge me just one more time. Lastly, when the life that you expected to have will not square up with the life that you actually have. Here's the last truth, and I'm in my seat. Remain faithful regardless of what happens. So he says in verse 6, And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. These words of Jesus now were not only meant to encourage John, but now these words are meant to reassure those within his listening audience who had placed their faith in him to re remind them all that, their, that, that they, their faith was not in vain and they needed to remain faithful. And so in this simple little beatitude, he says, and blessed are those who are not offended because of me. That word offended, that word offended in the Greek, it is a word from which we get our English word scandalized. It means to stumble. It means to fall, to fall into sin and unbelief. He says, you go back and tell John, don't stumble over me. Because living for me is not a guarantee that you're going to live an idealized life. No, if you live for me, you might end up in jail like John or with your head cut off like Paul or crucified upside down like Peter. It might mean you got to stay in a marriage that makes you miserable or you got to work on a job that you don't like or you got to go back and pastor that 175 people as if you're pastoring 7,000 because the reality is God didn't call you to be big. He calls you to be faithful. You just remain faithful faithful do I have a witness here sometimes the life you expected to have is not going to square up with the life that you actually have and the worst thing for you to do is to sit around and feel sorry for yourself and talk about I coulda I woulda I shoulda well it didn't happen like that so learn how to deal with it and learn how to go back to that church and preach as if you are preaching to the progressive national convention you go back and give those people your your best because the Lord's grace is that he called any of us and allowed any of us to preach his word in the first place do I have a witness in here there is Nelson Mandela who just like John the Baptist went to jail because of what he believed he went to jail not but unlike John who only went for two years 27 years he sat there on Robbins Island but he never stumbled he never fell away. He always kept his belief and he remained faithful to the cause. Child of God, that's what I've come to tell you today. God did not call you to be big. God has called you to be faithful. God did not call you to be popular. But rather he called you to be faithful. The Bible said, be thou faithful unto death. And God will give you a crown of life. Can I get a witness here? Because the reality is that he never promised us that life and ministry was going to be easy. He never promised us that uh -huh, we're going to have sunshine all the time. But the reality is that into each life some rain must fall. Can I get a witness here? And the easy thing to do uh, when life gets difficult is to throw in the towel and give up and say, I quit. But the Lord has sent me to tell you today uh -huh, that the God-honoring thing to do, the noble thing to do, is not to give up but rather to look up uh -huh, and tell yourself, I'm going to be faithful. I may not have the the life I want to have but I'm going to be faithful circumstances may not have turned out the way that I wanted them to but I'm going to be faithful can I get a witness because time is filled 
with swift transition not on earth unmoved can stand but build your hopes on things eternal and hold on to God's unchanging hand because we are often tossed and driven on this restless sea of time some skies and howling tempers of succeed the bright sunshine but in that land of perfect days when the mist has rolled away we'll understand it better by and by by and by when the morning comes when all the saints of God will be gathering home we're gonna tell the story of how we overcame we'll understand it better by and by tell your neighbor in the meantime I've made up my mind I'm gonna be faithful faithful to preaching faithful to teaching faithful to serving faithful to pastoring faithful to singing faithful faithful faithful